Let me tell you a story. It's about a giant. A basketball giant. Part fable. All real. His name was Wilson Norman Chamberlain. They called him the Big Dipper. Seven feet, one inch tall, and as athletic as any man who ever walked the earth. You try guarding that on a basketball court sometime. He played a game like no one had ever seen. He did things no one might ever see again. Like that night, 50 years ago, when he scored a hundred points. That's right, 100 points. The game wasn't on TV, just some pictures remain. But you better believe that night lives on in the memories of those who saw it and will never, ever forget it. This is where it happened. The sleepy little town of Hershey, Pennsylvania. Best known not for basketball, but chocolate. In the summer when we were out of school, that factory right over there, the chocolate factory, you could tour. So as kids, we would tour that factory about a dozen times a day. <laughs> and swipe as much candy as we could get, come across the street, sit and eat it, and then we'd go over again, and after about ten times, the, the guide would say, all right, you kids have had enough today. It was a company town. About 75, 80 years of history in that factory, and uh, thousands and thousands of people worked there. Do you work in there? Yeah. I worked for okay, now. 43 and a half years. It's oh, amazing. One for a couple, for a couple weeks. Earl Whitmore, Kerry Ryman, and Larry Wagner have lived in the Hershey area their whole lives. When they were younger, the Philadelphia Warriors and Will Chamberlain used to hold training camp here. The memories are as clear as ever. I'll tell you a story about Wilt. Uh, when, when the Warriors were breaking camp after their training camp was over, we always had a game between the varsity basketball of Milton Hershey against the Warriors. The Warriors run a play and I get picked and now I'm guarding Wilt. In one motion he picked me up, put the ball through, then set me on top of the basket. <laughs> and he had a big smile on his face. And he was a very strong man, very oh, strong man. man. People still tell stories like that about Will all the time. He was superhuman on the basketball court and everywhere else. One sports writer likened the first sight of Wilt to the first sight of the New York City skyline. It was majestic, whether seen from up close or afar, you just kind of went, wow. Wilt was a Paul Bunyan figure, mythic in what he could personally do. He was Goliath, the strongest uh, basketball player that ever lived. The case closed. When he made the movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, they were in a weight room. And Wilt says, well, how do you do that? And Arnold goes, well, this way you do it. You know, you push up. So I go, Will lays down on the bench, gets up under it. Bing, 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 bing. As far as the nigga never came into the weight room with Will again. Will and the Globetrotters were invited to the Kremlin. And they're having dinner, and they start bringing in the vodka. And so they're taking these shots, and the, and the Globetrotters are, are, are fading out. They're putting their head on their arm on the table, and it's down to the last two. Well, who do you think Will's left with? Nikita Khrushchev. 
one time we were talking, and he has all these scars on his arm. So I said, Wolfie, how'd you get those scars? He said, man, I was going across country, and I stopped for a break, and this mountain lion jumped out of a, of a rock and jumped on me. And I grabbed him, and he scratched me, and I killed him with my bare hands. I said, come on. He said, yeah, it's true. And he, you know, he did so many great things, I kind of believed him. On the court, Will was also a marvel. And I know that as well as anyone. By the time he came to the league in 1959, I had won two titles with the Celtics. But matching up against him was a whole different deal. We played 142 times over the next decade. And along the way, we changed basketball forever. Over the history of the NBA, that's probably as dramatic a matchup as you've ever seen any time. It was like two titans of the game meeting and you'd have headlines and Russell versus Chamberlain. And the papers and the fans and everyone played this up. I found myself watching those guys while I tried to play, while I tried to guard Havlicek. They were characters. You know, they both had goatees and they were both a product of their time, which was the 60s. And they were a little radical in their attitude. And they were the league. I'll never forget that time and those games against Wilt. A lot of people assume because we played so hard against each other, we hate each other. Nothing could be further from the truth. We were very, 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 very close. He'd come to my house at Thanksgiving and he'd bring Sam Jones and Casey Jones and they'd have dinner. My mother would cook them dinner and then Bill would go up to my bed and fall and fall asleep. When he'd come back down, my mother would say, now, William, you take it easy on my son tonight. You know, say, you know, they'd go out there and they'd beat us. You know, and then, you know, my, my mother would say, we're going to invite him to dinner no more. <laughs> no more. Will loved to tell stories like that. Stories that made that sound true, even if they often were. And that's what's so perfect about the day he scored 100 points. Because all the mystery surrounding the truth has always kept people wondering how it happened. There is a great mystique about this. Let's be honest about it. Nobody knew where the hell they were. Only one guy was there to report it. There were always questions about the game. This is West Philadelphia, where Will Chamberlain grew up. This is the house that Will grew up in. I personally remember we were finished playing basketball, then we would come past the house. If you came in, you had lemonade, you had cookies. Will wasn't really somebody that we thought of as special. We thought of Will as just somebody who was a part of all of us. They call Sunny Hill Mr. Basketball in Philadelphia. He and Wilt met on these streets when they were kids. The legendary one-of-a-kind Wilt Chamberlain played right here at Overbrook High School. Wilt would not only block your shot, Wilt could go up in the air and catch your shot, which was like, ooh, he was changing how basketball games were played in the mid-50s. He was just a teenager. Well, he was already a huge star and the most popular kid at Overbrook High. The whole aura of Will Chamberlain permeated the whole school. Everybody was excited about the possibility that we were going to have the greatest basketball player in history. It's impossible to describe. There was no way of stopping him. In our gym, he could run the length of the gym in four or five steps and dunk the ball. He scored 90 points in 28 minutes in the high school game. And he had 15 points in one minute. Every time you opened up the paper, you would read something about Will Chamberlain. Will's toughest competition back then came in the summers. When he worked at the famous Cutcher's Resort in the Catskill Mountains. I started playing against pros back when I was in high school. Up at Cutcher's, Ray Arbeck was coaching me. He had me go against some of his Boston Celtics boys, and I used to like to try to beat him to death. And when he was at school in the pros, he was the world's greatest bellhop. 
he could hand the bags up to the second floor and that would mean they wouldn't have to walk those bags up the steps which was legendary back in the day the legend grew at the university of kansas well what was a conference champion in the high jump and played a little basketball too coach bog allen calls chamberlain already one of the greatest players i've ever seen in his very first varsity game Wilt scored 52 points, and that's still a school record. Now, other coaches around the country said, if we're going to play Kansas and we're going to play Will Chamberlain, we're going to have to find out someone to stop this guy from scoring points. Record sellout throng turned out to watch the widely heralded Chamberlain. So they would put four guys around me on defense, and then when they got the ball, they would hold it. But even with them holding the ball, a lot of our games being 45 to 50 points, I was still averaging 30 points a game. But I didn't, I didn't care about the average as much as I wanted to get out there and play. I wanted to run and do the things that I thought basketball players were supposed to do. So after his junior year, he left Kansas and joined the most famous team in the world, the Harlem Globetrotters. The Globetrotters were playing some games before Warrior games in Philadelphia. Will Charles would play the first game, full house. And when they finished playing, the arena would empty out, and then the Warriors would play. The Trotters are a team of basketball wizards featuring one of the most talked about players in years, seven foot Will Chamberlain. When you're a kid, I mean, a black kid of that, the Harlem Globetrotters are like heaven. If it wasn't for the challenge of just playing with the best players in the world, I would probably never let the Globetrotters. He was a trotter for a year, and then in 1959, he joined the NBA, returning to Philly to play for the Warriors. I think there will be a period of orientation for me across like it is for every newcomer in the NBA, but I think in the long run, I'll be able to handle myself man to man with almost anyone in the league. It was a different league back then, featuring a different style of basketball. Rook changed all that very quickly. It was a slow motion, slow dance game. Most of the guys in the league couldn't dunk. And here comes this phenomenon showing everybody what the future is. Chamberlain electrified the crowd with his celebrated different dunk. No athlete in a team sport has ever brought the elements of size, strength, and speed into a league as the young Will Chamberlain brought into the NBA in 1959. Chamberlain with the rebound. Oh! Stylistically, he was unprecedented. There was nobody who was like Wilt. You know, this was the first real athlete, seven feet and above. He changed the concept of the game from being played on the floor to being played above the basket. Period. End of the point. As a rookie, he won the MVP and led the league in scoring and rebounding. The table underneath. But that was just the start of his impact. There were a lot of black players that played at a really great level, and somehow they could not get in the league. So clearly it had to be color, because it couldn't be skills. The fact that uh, most of the teams had only one or two black players on it began to change, and uh, it changed because of certainly the gifts and the skills of Wilt. He was blessed with his height and his athleticism, but there's also awareness, intelligence, and confidence. I came into a game that was very limited to having black players. It was so limited that the only real black player of any high white collar job, so to speak, meaning scoring points, was Elgin Bailey. Every other black player ever was in the league was a blue collar worker. He was a guy who was getting rebounds for his team and passing it out to the other scorers and so forth. Then along comes me, and I don't care about giving the ball to somebody else. I'm gonna do it my I'm gonna do it my, my, my myself. Will showed up. Now, a lot of people looked at it as a great black athlete, gained the attention of the sports world, and was great doing it and didn't have to apologize for what he was doing. When 
he did that. You know, that spoke volume for everybody who ever played basketball. He was not going to allow race in any way to define him or to diminish him. And so there he was making $75,000 a year, more than any other player in the NBA in 1961. And night after night, he's playing against the best white players in the league, and he's tearing it up. Now, anybody who knew Wilt knows he wasn't just about basketball. Just as Carl Green, Seth Sanders, and Cal Ramsey. They remember when Wilt came to Harlem and took over Small's Paradise, making it, of course, the center of the party. Now, I have to tell you, Dion Warwick was up, and Wilt was posing on the, on the bar, and I remember her trying to decide who was the best looking of the three of us. And I remember Dion Warwick picking Cal Ramsey, and Wilt just shook his head. He just couldn't believe it, that she would even consider us two in his company. You know what I enjoyed about the club, though, was the entertainment. Yeah. I mean, and every weekend they had a great, great entertainment. Mm -hmm. And the place yeah. would be packed. Oh, the other part about that was uh, because it was Chamberlain, because it was Will spot, a lot of entertainers wanted to be there. Yeah. yeah. They wanted to be in the spot where things were happening. There was no question that he was a magnet, because we were all, everybody enjoys being there. Yeah. Company. Particularly in his place. Yeah. No problem walking through there and touching all the folks at the table, shaking hands, and et cetera. And he was the perfect host in terms of getting around. I can recall seeing Alge in there, seeing Oscar Robertson there, all the great ball players from the, in the Eastern area would always come up and hang up there. He was in love with New York. Yeah. And, oh. and that's one of the reasons why he established New York as his base. That's right. We're playing Philly. But he lived in the only city big enough for him, New York. That's amazing to me yeah. that you could get up and drive every morning to Philly to practice and then come back to New York. With a limited amount of speed tickets, too, you know? So, March 2nd, 1962, Wilt Chamberlain comes to Hershey, Pennsylvania for a game. And mind you, this kind of tiny city was pretty familiar to players at the time. NBA was not big league. It needed to be worked on, it needed to be promoted, and it needed to be sold. If you came up with $3,000, you could get the Celtics to come in and play. And if you came up with six, you can get two NBA teams. Back then, the NBA hadn't really even arrived yet. We used to play double headers. We had four teams of play in one building. We played preseason games all through the Midwest. And Hershey, Pennsylvania was where we used to have training camp. And so they'd always form a couple games out there. So we, it wasn't anything new to us. But the game that night in Hershey Sports Arena was a pain for Wilt. Because before he could go to Hershey, he had to make his normal commute from up in Harlem. I had not had an hour's sleep. I lived in New York City. I had to commute from New York to Philadelphia to catch a team bus and there from 11 to 12 o'clock. And if anyone knew me at that time, I had a insomniac and I never really went to bed before 4 or 5 in the morning. And so sometimes it's better just to stay up. Plus, I had a date that night before and so everything led to me not having a night's sleep. I remember getting into the bus, going to Hershey from Philadelphia and said, boy, am I tired. When we get to Hershey about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there were no hotels supposed to go to his day in because we didn't do those kind of things in those days. We went straight to the arena where we had to wait around for five or six hours for the game. They were there so early that they had something to while away their time by going here into this Penny Arcade, which is quite different today than it was then. Because over, right over in this section was a shooting uh, gallery. And I started shooting rifles and so on and so forth, and I couldn't miss anything. 
said one of my closest friends, Ike Richmond, he had talked to the guy out the door who had worked in the arena for 20 years and said, the highest numbers ever posted here was such and such a thing. So he would bet me that I couldn't beat that. But I just blew all the numbers away. So if there was ever a clue that I was going to have a high day, this was definitely the, the, the clue. Harry Pollock has worked for the NBA since the league started in 1946. He still works for the 76ers. And he was the one keeping score that night in Hershey. Fifty years ago I was here. On this floor. When Wilk got that 100 points. Some people don't even think the game was ever played. In fact, uh, there have been several articles written which say that this game was a figment of Harvey Pollock's imagination. I want to congratulate myself for uh, thinking of such a thing. Harvey was there, but most of his colleagues in the press didn't make the trip. The New York guys didn't cover it at all. Who wants to take a bus ride from New York to Hershey on a on a Friday night in March. There was one writer from the Philadelphia Papers who covered the game. Virtually no press. Harvey covered it for everybody. I was the PR director of the Warriors, the game statistician, the writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Associated Press, and United Press International. I've been in the NBA for 65 years, and this was by far the busiest night of my career. So I needed a hundred points. I got a hole in the head. Meanwhile, for some young men in Hershey, missing both and the Warriors was out of the question. This is the door that we used to come in most nights. Fifteen of us would each chip in some change to buy one ticket for downstairs here. It was two dollars for the blue seats. And the guy that got the ticket that was in here would come back and he'd open up this door. Now we'd be all out here in this catwalk waiting. Once we came in, we headed into this bathroom right here. And we'd get up with our shoes up on the seats so you couldn't see. And we'd lock the doors and wait in there for five or ten minutes. And then we'd head out. And when they got into the arena and found some empty seats, what they saw down on the floor was an unstoppable basketball force. 25-year-old Wilt Chambers, at the height of his powers, making virtually every shot he took. I was shooting out of realms that I normally don't shoot it. I usually stayed pretty much in, in, in the post, turn around favorite jump shots. But I was shooting jump shots from over the top of the key and running around. I was really hitting very, very well. He had 23 at the end of the first period. And I remember coming back to the huddle. And Richie Guerin comes in, and Richie says, kind of like in jest, he says, the big fella's going for 100 tonight. <laughs> Well, always beat him on the Knicks. On this night, he just feasted away. We were a little short-handed that game. Phil, uh, Phil Jordan, our, our center, was sick. They said he had a shoulder injury, but he'd really had a late night out, and he was rooming with Donnie Butcher. And when Butcher left to go to the team bus, he heard uh, Jordan in the, in the bathroom vomiting, saying, Butch, I ain't gonna make it. So the Knicks are going one man short, and that man happens to be 6'10". The backup center was named Darrell M. Hoff. No match for Wilt at all. And then there was the third stringer, Cleveland Buckner. Cleveland was like 6'7", 6'8", and a, a, a slender type of body. So, you know, it's like putting a child against a man. So then the Knicks tried Dave Bud, even smaller, at six foot six. And I tried to beat him down the floor and stand where he wanted to stand, maybe force him out of a couple steps. Well, that didn't work too long, because if he wanted to move back, he moved back. The Knicks had all their one other choice with Wilt. 
fallen. At that time, certainly he was one of the worst free throw shooters in the league. And what people couldn't understand is he could put the ball in a basket with three guys hanging off his arms, and some guy biting him on his shin, and uh, now you take everybody away, and it's like the basket is moving. On this particular night, remember what we said earlier about the uh, arcade, that it was a special night was in effect? Well, here's another special thing that happened. Well, didn't miss anything. He took 14 foul shots in the first half, and he missed just one. And so, you know, Will begins now to build this Everest. You know, he's going to be at 41 points at the half, 13 of them from, from the free throw line. So something big is going on here, but you still don't know how big. If Will was going to ever score 100 points in a game, it was going to happen in that 61-62 season. Why? Well, it all starts with his new coach that year, Frank McGuire. He had a great deal of belief in, in my ability, and he instilled that belief into the team, and he actually put me in a position to have maybe the greatest single season that I think a basketball player could possibly ever have. McGuire gave Wilt the key to the offense of this team. He gave him the key to the season. He said, go ahead, big fella, take it away. Let's see how high we can fly. And he starts throwing down these thunderbolts. He goes 48-25 the first game, 57-32 rebounds the second, and then 53-55-43. Silly numbers, crazy numbers. Wilt spins around his defender and garners points 47 and 48. Frank McGuire had two rules. The offense always went through Wilt, and Wilt never left the floor. In an 80-game season, he played 79 complete games. He missed eight minutes of one game because he got thrown out. Other than that, he played every moment of every one of those games. That was inconceivable to us. How the hell do you stay so strong all season? How do you avoid falling out? How do you take a beating every night with guys pushing you, punching you, grabbing you, and come back the next night fresh as a daisy? How the hell do you do this, Will? Just one game, 48 minutes a game, is really innocuous, ass, but uh, playing a whole season, 48 minutes a, a game. I mean, when I look back in retrospect, I say, what were they doing to me? Jesus, there must have been some time when I could have gotten, gotten a rest. But unbelievably, he never took one. And even more astounding was his scoring. It's a record, of course. 50 points a game. That's right. 5-0. 50. Man's averaging 50 points a game. <laughs> He's averaging 50. A bad night is 44. He gets 63. He gets 70. I mean, miraculous things. We were in awe of what he was doing out there against the best players in the world. Chamberlain's 61-62 season, it almost looks cartoon-like in its dominance. Michael Jordan scored 50 or more points 31 times in his career. Impressive. Wilt did it 45 times in one season. So by March 2nd, with five games left in the season, anything seemed possible for Wilt. Three or four weeks earlier than that, Frank McGuire had said to the press, well, one day soon, Wilt will probably score 100, 100 points. In Hershey, remember, he had 41 at halftime. But in the third quarter, he picked up the pace to make his coach's prediction a real possibility. Rogers takes the jump shot. It's no good. Chamberlain with a rebound. That's it in. He's got another one. We're just conjecturing it. How many can he make? At the end of the third, he had 69. And as the fourth began, he wasn't about to slow down. 
Inside the Chamberlain. He's got it. Chamberlain of 75. It was like watching some sort of a natural cataclysmic disaster, maybe, you know, an earthquake or, uh, <laughs> or uh, you know, a, a flood of some sort. It was magnificent. If you're listening on the radio in Philly, announcer Bill Campbell was keeping you posted on Wilt. But if you were in the arena, it was legendary Philadelphia PA announcer Dave Zinkoff. He was in his glory because he was announcing every point in the second half that Wilt scored. As the game wore on, all the people in the audience followed the zinc and made like a chorus, like it was a musical with a chorus in the background. There's an announcement by Dave Zinkoff. Zinkoff is informing the Warriors. This is how how much you know further you need to go to, to get to the top of Everest. History being written tonight in Hershey. The big man has broken the record and he's gone for more. You know what's in the fans' mind? They're thinking of the magic number, 100. <laughs> I do remember Zinkoff calling out every basket. And that's 82. And that's 83. And then it started plugging here. The thing about this is plugging in with all the warrior people. It's also plugging in with all the Knickerbocker people. Your Honor and Dennis the Wolf, New York's got three men in front of him. What a comfortable around, too. He's got it now. He's bangs it in. Everything now is intensified. It's the moment that, you know, everyone is now clear what's at stake. And now the Knicks are playing to defend their good name or what's left of their good name. Because if this happens, they know this much that 50 years later, they're still going to be talking about this. Remember how earlier in the game, Richie Guerin joked that the big fellow's gonna go for a hundred. Now, it didn't seem so funny to old Richie. Richie Guerin is a tough character, and I have nothing but the highest uh, respect for him, especially if he's waiting outside. Is a U.S. Marine. He would take a step back from nobody, and he did not want to see Wilt score a hundred points. The Knicks were 20 points behind during the last three or four minutes of the game, and they were freezing the ball. You don't see a team losing by 20 or 30 freezing the ball. And while they were freezing it, we were fouling them so that we'd get the ball back. And then consequently, when we did get the ball back, they were trying to foul our guards before the ball would get into Will. But my teammates, once they got the ball, made sure they couldn't get fouled, they ran in positions where they couldn't be, and got me the ball under any circumstances. Marisi with the ball down the right side, passes to Chamber, and he's open, he shoots the ball. It was time for the last steps up the mount. One minute and one second to play, he has 98 points. Rogers throws one to Chamberlain. He's got it. He's trying to get up. He shoots. No good. The lead on Luckinville. Back to Chamberlain. He shoots up. No good. The lead on Luckinville. Back to Rutlick. Joe Rutlick was Wilt's backup, so he never played. But now, he had the ball in his hands, and a big decision to make. New York is everywhere. The time's running out, the fans are going nuts. Zink is probably yelling at me, Joe, get the ball in the world, with the mic off. He, he, but the guy's collapsed all around him, and I'm wide open. I've got a shot that's 12 feet. I can get into the score column in this game with a quick jump shot. But instead of the scoring column, Joe chose the history book. I stop dribbling and I hold the ball, 
and I see Wilt moving around, and he says, oh, and he puts his hands like this. He bumps a guy off of his hip, and there he is. I threw him the ball. Boom, the rest is history. After we scored, he ran back to be on, def on defense. By the time he, he got in front of midcourt, the fans had already started coming out of the court. He was sort of perplexed. <laughs> what was he going to do? He just stood there and uh, held, held, held the hands of everybody. The basket and he getting mobbed are to my left. I choose not to shake hands with him. I made a very calculated decision. I go over to the official scorer who's standing applauding and say, when he sits down, don't forget to give me that assist. <laughs> You never saw more people excited for one person than that. I mean, grown men acting like a group of little children. There are a lot of stories about the 100-point game and a lot of myths, too, like this one concerning how the game actually ended. It was still 46 seconds on that clock when I scored 100 points. But since that's all the fans wanted, and the officials felt like that was enough to, you know what I'm saying, the game was over. The people came on the floor. And so that's one of maybe the few games in the history of the NBA that never, ever finished. That's what Will remembers, but the radio broadcast proves the game did end. New York Fall, that's the game. Four seconds left. Three, New York are falling out the back. Yet, there's still another unsolved mystery. What happened to the ball shot by Will to score his final basket? Will went up and dunked the ball. The ball came down through there. And Wilt didn't touch the ball. The referee grabbed the ball when it came down, and he knew it was the 100th point, and he brought the ball over to me at the uh, press table there. That's Harvey Pollock's version. Kerry Robin tells a different tale. When Chamberlain scored his 100th point, uh, the referee had the ball, and he threw it to Wilt. By this time, I'm out onto the court. I was the first one there. I shook his hand, and when he bounced the ball on the court, I don't know why, but I took I took the ball. <laughs> and uh, up the steps I went. I took it because I wanted to play with it. And when I got home, my parents weren't too happy with what I did. <laughs> Eventually, the crowd of 4,000 left the Hershey Sports Arena, and Wilk went back to the locker room. That's where Harvey Pollock conceived of the image that perfectly captured the spirit of the night. The day after the game, when I came in, Wilk was about over here, sitting here on a stool. I see this photographer standing there, and I said, did you take your pictures yet? She said, I don't know what to take. She said, what can I do? So I thought for a second, I looked over at Jim Heffernan at a bullet, and I walked over. Harvey asked me, do you have any paper, Heff? And I said, I gave him a piece of what we called copy paper then. That's what you wrote your story on. And I said, how about if I write 100 on the pad? And he said, well, what are you going to do with that? I said, how about if I have Will hold this sign up here? So I walked over to Wilt. I said, Wilt, you see this sign? 
that indicates what you did here tonight. And the tower's going to take a picture of you. He says, hey, great idea. It's just Will sitting on this bench, and he's just kind of sheepishly looking at a camera, holding up a piece of paper. But it works. It's as great as any image that's ever been taken in basketball. You know, whether it's Julius Irving's dunks or Michael Jordan levitating or the sky hook by Kareem, that image trumps them all. After you shower, Will's had to get home just like anyone else. And since home is New York, as the story goes, he hits a ride with a couple of Knicks. I'm surprised they even wanted him in the car. You know, here's a guy who just got 100 points against me, blew my brains out, and I was riding back in my car, taking him back to New York. And I immediately fell asleep. And while I'm falling asleep and we hit a toll road stop, I gotta wake up and I can hear them saying, can you believe that SOB got 100 points against us? And the whole conversation for two and a half hours with them calling me these names, well, finally, they dropped me off at my house first, and I get out of the car. I said, hey, fellas, uh, thanks for all that, you know, and I'm so sorry about that 100 points. <laughs> I said, I said, I mean, I didn't really mean to be an SOB, but what the hell? <laughs> and with that, Wilton Norman Chamberlain finally went to sleep. It was an achievement like none other in basketball history. But one of many Will Chamberlain would author during his career. Still, for a long time, Will could get up that other basketball mountain and win a championship. Over his first seven seasons in the league, I'm proud to say the Celtics won every title. And the Celtics, they have done it again. I know that frustrated Will. But when he finally did win, with the 76ers in 67, it was in typical Wilt fashion. With the team not just great, but historically great. With more wins at that time than any team in league history. And then five years later, his Lakers team won even more games. Putting together a 33 game win streak, the longest of all time. There's always some amazing number attached to him. You know, 100 points, 50 points a game. Now he's on a team winning 33 straight games. It's almost like you imagine him going home at night and thinking, what next? What, what would be a good number? And then he'd go out and do it. He played a game against the Detroit Pistons. In the game, he blocked 26 shots on the 55 rebound game. How about that? Against Bill Russell. Wolf won seven scoring titles. He won nine shooting titles. He won 11 rebound titles. And then he left the league in assists one year. When he was in the latter part of his career, the news media or somebody would walk up to him and say, oh, you can't score anymore. 50, 60, and then he'd go back to passing the ball and whatever. If you challenged him, that just took him to another level in terms of, okay, I'll do this. I'll do that. It's not possible for any human being to do the kinds of things that he was able to do. In 1973, Wilt walked away from the NBA, but his presence will continue to loom over the game. As we sit here right now, Wilt owns over 90 records in the NBA, and he hasn't played in the NBA in the last 40 years. He retired because he decided he didn't want to play anymore. But for 10 or 15 years after that, there would be story after story, usually around February or March, or Wilt's thinking of making a comeback. 
He never did come back. But I would have liked to have seen it. Could he have held his own at the age of 50? What was capable of just about anything? Like scoring 100 points in a single game. 100 points. It's a perfect monument to the man. A number easy to remember. Stunning to comprehend. The NBA has been here since 1946. There's only been one guy in the history of the NBA to score 100 points. There's only one. Will's 100 point night is the statistical Everest. There's nothing in American sports that can come close. The only sad part of telling the story 50 years later is that Wilt isn't around to talk about it with us. I would say that other than a 100-point game, the only time that Wilt actually shocked the public was when he died. For someone who did extraordinary feats, it took the most ordinary thing ever for people to say, oh my. We had seen him as such a strong man, such an impactful physical figure in the game. There was just no way in the world we would think that Will Chamberlain would not live to be at least a hundred. You know death is inevitable for everybody, but you just think that there's some people that are too big, too strong. This can't happen to them. He's the one who made me better. He's the one who made everyone wonder what was possible. Not just on that night of March 2nd, 1962. But every time he walked into a room, will anyone ever score 100 points in an NBA game again? I suppose it could theoretically happen. But will there ever be another Will Chamberlain? Absolutely not. Part fable, all real, and a legend everyone wanted to be a part of. He's been gone now for more than a decade, and I still miss him. I have a few big stories I tell to get a little bigger, like the fish stories. Well, this is the one true story that I must, I must tell you. There was a little over 4,000 people there at the game, but I have at least 50,000 people who have told me Oh, yeah, you know, I was there when you scored the 100 points. I said, oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you know, I live in New York City, you know, so my father's going to the garden, you know, you know, you know, some people would say Philadelphia. No one ever says Hershey, Pennsylvania, who tells me that story. But I think is what they're saying to you is that we remember you, Will, and the thing we remember the most about you was that 100-point game. <laughs> 